As we jump into being dressed for life, recap a little bit of what we've looked at over the last few weeks. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says uh, to the church, he says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that the day, when the day of evil comes, it's not if, it's when, uh, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil, evil ones. So all those things that Satan keeps trying to throw at our lives to bring destruction. He says, you know, have faith in what God is already doing in your life. Have faith in what God has done in your life and move forward with confidence that that he's in control of your life. And then he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit could be really easily uh, taught on together, but I'm going to separate them just for this week because the helmet of salvation, I believe, has to be in place, firmly in place, for you to be able to use the sword of the spirit. And we'll get into that next week a little bit more, just a teaser to make you come back next weekend. <clears throat> but the helmet of salvation, I believe, provides, it protects us, uh, it gives discernment, And it provides confidence in life and as we go through life. Now, I'm sure it does more than this, but these are some of the things that I can see right in it. I'm like, yeah, this is obvious of what a helmet does. Now, as Paul is there and he's in prison and he's writing this and he's got armed guards beside him and he's got the Roman soldiers all around him, he's looking at the Roman soldiers and he's seeing how they're decked out and the things that they use. And and as he looks at them, he sees that helmet. He knows that helmet gives them protection in a lot. Lot of things that they do. Now, if you are here in the room and you're, you know, 40 or over and you learned how to ride a bicycle when you were younger, there's a good chance you never wore a helmet. Matter of fact, if you saw somebody wearing a helmet, you thought that was a sissy, right? <clears throat> now you realize they're just wise. But back then it was, oh, what a wimp. Why is he wearing a helmet? But helmets really do protect us. Now, I've been hit by, I'm riding my bicycle, I've been hit by a car a couple times, and I really should have had a helmet on because I don't remember anything about it <laughs> or the day of. Uh, you know, it, helmets really do protect you, and they, they, they're able to keep you safe from harm that could come in. Uh, and overwhelm you. And so when we look at the helmet of salvation, understanding salvation is from Jesus and what Jesus has done in our life, the helmet of salvation is locking in the thought process of what Jesus has done and the things that Jesus wants to do and speak into our life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, we demolish arguments and every <clears throat> petition... Perdition that set itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So when we put on the helmet of salvation, we're saying, okay, I'm going to take captive every thought and make it obedient to what I know Jesus says about situations, circumstances, and life. And the way that I should live my life. Even today as you are worshiping. Somewhere along the line, there was thoughts that came at you that were distracting you from worship. And in that moment, you had a choice of following that thought or going, no, I'm going to take captive my thoughts and I'm going to focus back in on why I'm here. And what I'm supposed to be doing right now is acknowledging God in in these songs and, and even praying to God in these songs and inviting him into my life in this time of worship. Basically, you put the helmet of salvation on to restrict your thought process so that it was focused in the right direction. See, the helmet of salvation protects us, protects the voice of the Holy Spirit in us. So when we are saved, we've invited Jesus into our life. You know, if you're here and you're searching out spiritual things or you're watching us online and you're seeking out spiritual things and the helmet of salvation is basically after you've said, you know what, I believe in who Jesus is. I believe that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sin. And you've asked him to remove that sin and place his spirit in you, to give you guidance in life, to move you through life so that he can be the one that directs your life. The helmet of salvation basically 
put on us is restricting other voices from directing your life. And you're listening to his spirit that dwells within. So you're stopping the outside voice and you're listening to the inside voice because that's the spirit of God. In, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 through 14, it says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. Now, when, when Paul is talking about this, he's talking about listening and being obedient to the Spirit. In this world today, there is many voices speaking at us all the time. There's things that we're inviting into our life to influence us or things that we're inviting into our life that we're giving them room in our, in our life to believe in that way. And there's all kinds of people trying to tell you how to live your life. And what's right for your life and what's not right for your life. And the way to think and the way not to think. And I'm one of them this morning. But you have to determine who you're going to give space in your life. Some of those voices are very positive. Some of those voices are destructive. Because they're contrary to what God would say. In, in verse 14, he goes on, he says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. That's why sometimes when you're talking to somebody about you know, what you believe or what Scripture means to you or what God has said into your life, and they're not a believer, they look at you like, you're crazy. Because it's foolishness to them. They don't understand it because the Spirit is not testifying, as it were, to their spirit. It's not saying, yes, this... But what happens is that when somebody comes to that point in life, they're like, you know what? There's more to life than just me. There's more to life than what I see. And they begin to seek out spiritual things. And they open themselves up to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. It transforms the way they think. And the helmet of salvation is to lock in that transformation. It's so that we're able to protect us from the outside voice beginning to rule our life again. The helmet of salvation separates the voice of the Spirit and the voice of the world. And today, the voice of the world is screaming very loudly. And it is contrary to the voice of the Spirit of God. And if you're not careful, it can be the voice that we listen to the most. See, the helmet of salvation is a deliberate choice to guard your mind. It's a deliberate choice to guard the influence in your life. And it's a deliberate choice, parents, that you make over your family as to who is going to have the ability to speak into your children's life. Who's going to have the ability to influence your children? When my kids were growing up, we, we, we had a few rules in our, in our home that were around things that could be watched and things that could be listened to. There was no cartoons allowed in our house that had anything to do with witchcraft, which would turn off most of them today. Disney has just gone in the very wrong direction, which it used to be very safe for kids. But unfortunately, it's bringing an influence into your children that is not of God. So parents, I encourage you, guard your kids. Guard your kids. Guard your own mind. Music. Ooh. Music is a huge influencer in lives. Our children were not allowed to listen to secular music in our home. If we heard it, we took whatever away was being played. They were not allowed to listen to secular music in our home of any kind until they've come now to the age of turning 16 and the other one's turning 19, until they were teenagers and they knew and understood the difference between good and bad. And they could distinguish but it was our responsibility to put our helmet of salvation on them until they could put it on themselves. And so, parents, it's your responsibility to do that. And, and you know, my kids, that sometimes they, they were like, well, Dad, and I was like, I don't care. It's my rule. It's my house. I paid for that device you're listening to. I gave it to you. I can take it away. But it's my responsibility as a parent to do that, to guard my children and to guard my own mind 
from the TV shows that we watch to the music that we listen to. Now, I understand there's some secular music that's fine. It's just good music. I understand that. I don't listen to secular music. I mean, if I'm in a store, I can't turn it off because it's not my store. But I just don't because I don't need that influence in my mind. And my kids might say a song, and I'm like, Dad, don't you know that? No. And go back to the 80s when I wasn't serving the Lord, and I can tell you almost every song <laughs> because it has such an influence on your mind. I can remember them so clearly, and I can remember the activities that I associated with those songs. So parents, guard your children and guard your own mind. Helmet of Salvation also gives discernment because, again, it's Holy Spirit speaking within us and pushing out those other thoughts that are there. Now, Romans chapter 12 tells us an act of worship is to renew our minds. So when, re when we renew our minds and allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds, we have to guard that so that the other influences don't come in and pollute that again. And the helmet of salvation gives us the sermon of what should be speaking into us and what we should be listening to and following. In Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, it says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is peace, is, is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. Because the sinful mind will always try to push away what Holy Spirit is saying. Because it's ruled by the, the spirit of this world. It's rule, now, it's hard to grasp this. But remember what Paul says when it comes to the armor of God. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and spirits of this world. And so whatever we're allowing to influence us is going to guide us. And when the Holy Spirit, when we say, Jesus, I believe who you are. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and fill me with your spirit. Come alive within me. Give me new life, that new beginning. When we say that, his spirit takes up residency in us, and his spirit begins to transform us from that time on. And then there's a battle between the worldly spirit and the spirit of God that resides within you. And at that point, we have to give control to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God. Galatians chapter 5 tells us this. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us be led by him. Let, it, let him guide our thoughts. Let him guide our desires. Let him guide our actions so that we are walking in the fullness that God has for us. Now, the helmet of salvation, and I'll mention this again next week, but the helmet of salvation has to be firmly in place for you to be able to wield the sword of the Spirit. Because if it's not in place, you don't know how to use the sword of the Spirit. And so next week, I'll unpack that a little bit more. But the helmet of, place, helmet of salvation has to be in place so that you're hearing the Spirit in order to wield what the Spirit is saying. The helmet of salvation dis <clears throat> discerns actions that please God. The helmet of the Spirit helps us to understand the things in our life that are going to be pleasing to the Lord. Now, one of the things I want to encourage you to is influences in your life. Yeah, there's media, there's music, there's, but there's also friends. And it doesn't mean you're not their friend, but it does mean sometimes you just got to shut that voice off. And you've got to distance that voice because it's a voice that's going to lead you in the wrong direction. And it's easy to know what that voice is because it's contrary to the Spirit of God in you. The challenge is, is you love the person behind the voice. And you want that person part of your life. And I totally understand that. But you can't let that person be the influence in your life. And so there's going to be people in your life, if you truly are going to put the helmet of salvation on and walk with the helmet of salvation on, you are going to have to cut them off in your life. You're like, no, it's my life. I'm going to do whatever I want to do with it. No, you can't. 
That's where we die to self and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Now, it doesn't mean you hate them. doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. It just means they're not the influence in your life. It means Holy Spirit's the influence in your life. It means you, you get to know other people that are like-minded, that are wearing the helmet of salvation, and they're the ones that become the primary speakers into your life and the influences in your life. Go to things like the men's breakfast that's coming up. Meet some men that love God and, and want to grow in God and know who God is and become a, a godly man. Go to the women's breakfast that's coming up. And again, just get to know other ladies that you can do life with that are going to encourage you spiritually and challenge you spiritually. They're going to challenge you spiritually to listen to the voice of the Spirit in your life over the voice of the world all around you. So the helmet of salvation discerns the actions that please God. In Proverbs chapter 3, 5 through 6, it tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. In all of our ways, all of our ways, not just some of the ways, all of our ways. And that's allowing his Holy Spirit, his voice to speak through the other noise and even our own desires so that I'm acknowledging Jesus' desires for my life, not just my desires. And he's transforming my mind, and it becomes an act of worship unto God. Then the helmet of salvation always, and all, <clears throat> helmet of salvation provides confidence. You know, when I, when I played sports, you know, I played some uh, different sports, but football and rugby, of course, rugby, you don't wear a helmet, and then in football, you wear a helmet, and uh, there was times in playing football that I would stick my head in places just because I knew I had a helmet on, and I knew it would protect my head. And then I would switch to rugby after football season, and I broke my nose because I put my head somewhere it shouldn't be, and I had nothing to protect it. And actually, I was thinking about this last night. <clears throat> the month before we moved to Calgary, I had my nose fixed, so it's not as crooked as it used to be. But anyway, the helmet gives you a confidence to do things that in the natural you wouldn't do. I remember I mentioned when I was a kid, I, I, you know, rode a bicycle. We had motorcycles and snowmobiles. So on the motorcycles and snowmobiles, I always wore a helmet because, of course, they went faster and more dangerous. But on a bike, I never wore a helmet. And I, I loved to bike all over our city. And there was a, a, a park in our city. It's a big park. And it's called Victoria Park. And, and at the backside of Victoria Park, there's all these trails all through the woods that are up and down. And they're for mountain bikes. And there's, you know, you can go across logs and all this stuff. So I went there. I was like 19 or 20 when I was doing this, and, and I went with another friend of mine. And when I got there, I was home from university in the summer, and when I got there, um, he had a helmet on, and, you know, and he's, he's riding in there because he's been in there before, and I had no helmet. And so as I'm driving through there, I'm having a blast, and I realize that he's pulling ahead of me. He's going a little faster than I am, and I'm timid because there's tree branches hitting me in the head. And I realized that as I'm going up and down these hills and all over the place, the path is about this wide, and there's some big trees right there. And if I slip, I'm going to hug one of those trees. So the next time I went, I went out and bought a helmet. The next time I went, I went much faster because I had a confidence that wasn't just my own. I had a confidence of something I could rely on. And when it comes to the helmet of salvation, it gives us a confidence of who Jesus is in our life and what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do in our life. There's a passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians was written about 10 years before Ephesians was written. And I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but Paul talks in 1 Thessalonians about the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. In verse 8, he says, But since we belong to the day, we're not people of the night, we're not people of sin, we're people of the light, we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith, and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And the hope, the word hope here in this passage of scripture is looking forward with confident expectation. 
the hope of salvation, confident expectation that God is working on our behalf today and will be working on our behalf in eternity. He goes on in verse 9, he says, For God did not appoint us to suffer with wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake Facing the challenges of today, no matter what we're doing or we're asleep, we may live together with him. That Jesus is walking with us today. And that helmet of salvation, understanding that Jesus is with us, that he's empowering us, that he's walking with us, he's going to protect us. It gives us a confidence to do things that we just never would have done on our own. It gives us a confidence to move forward with expectation that God is there for us. And we can sing songs like, he's a miracle worker. We can sing songs like, he's the way maker in my life. We can sing songs like, I am a child of God. That I'm no longer a slave to fear, that I am a child of God. Because we have this confident hope. We have this confident expectation of the promises of God over our life. Confidence for today and for tomorrow. The helmet of salvation is a deliberate act. That's why Paul tells us to put on the helmet of salvation. Not just to have it, but to wear it. And to walk with it on us at all times so that we can move forward with a confidence that Jesus is going to direct our steps and he's going to protect us when we go through things. He's going to protect every <clears throat> weapon that is formed against you. He's going to give you the confidence that you can overcome and not be overcome. The helmet of salvation protects, it gives discernment, and it provides confidence. It gives us a confidence that, that we can move into every circumstance that the Lord leads us into. That when Holy Spirit says, hey, I want you to go across the room and talk to that person, that he's going to help you in that moment. And it gives us the confidence that no matter what happens to us. Now, remember, Paul is writing this at a time when the church was under tremendous persecution. And as they're under persecution, they're being literally killed for their faith. And when he speaks to them, he challenges them, hey, he's going to help you today. But even if you die, you've got an eternity with him. You know, in North Africa, some of you that are from Africa, you understand what's going on in North Africa right now. In North Africa, I just got a report this week that some of our churches and church planters that are there, they're literally being hauled out of their churches and being put to death. And some of them are being put in jail and their families uh, put in jail. And, but these people have a confidence in who God is in their life. We don't face that same type of persecution here in North America. We, we don't face those same challenges. So when we think about this confidence that he's going to help us, usually it's talking to my neighbor about Jesus or sharing the gospel with a co-worker or, or just saying no to something that we don't believe in. And we think about the persecution that somebody might go, oh, well, who do you think you are? And that's the worst thing we face here. But there's individuals still all over the world that when they read this and they realize that he's my hope for today and he's my confidence for tomorrow, that they literally can take a step of faith that can mean they might lose their life. Let's not forget that when we're facing challenges here and we put on the helmet of salvation and we think that the hardest thing we're facing is somebody thinking we're a little crazy because they don't understand that the gospel brings life. But to them, it's still foolishness because they don't have the Holy Spirit residing within them. I love that, that scripture tells us that the gospel is foolishness to those that don't believe, but is the power of, self, power of life, power of salvation to those that do. Because it lets us know there are going to be people that think it's foolish. And that's normal. So expect that until they see the power of salvation in your life and it brings a transformation in their life so it's that hope that God is for us and he can carry us through anything so if you're watching today or you're here in this room and you don't have that hope or what Jesus can do in your life or what he's made available for your life I want to 
want to give you an opportunity just to accept Jesus into your life where the foolishness becomes power to transform your mind, to transform your life, to give you a hope and give you a future. And if that's you today, and Holy Spirit is literally speaking to you, just saying, this is what you need. You need something in your life that's beyond yourself where God literally places his spirit inside of us and removes sin and gives us a purpose and a hope and a future. If that's you today, I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer that would invite him into your life, whether you're in this room or you're watching us online. So I'm going to ask you if you would just to bow your head just for a moment. And if you're here and if you're listening and Holy Spirit is speaking to you and he's saying, you know, this is what I have for you. I have a new life for you. I have a new beginning for you. And I want to walk with you. And you sense in your spirit that, yeah, this is what I need. Just before I lead you in a prayer, I'd love to know who would want to pray that prayer with me. So I'm going to just look across the room quickly. And if you'd say, yeah, I need that, just simply look at me. And say, yeah, Pastor, I need to pray that prayer. I need Jesus in my life. My right, your left. If that's you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. If that's you today, just simply look up and say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank you. And over to my left and your right, if that's you. Yeah. Right there, simply pray this. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Fill me with your spirit. Renew my mind and empower me to live the life you've created before. And Father, I pray for us all that God, as we put on the helmet of salvation, that protection that you have, Father, over the influence in our lives, God, that you will give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us. God, you give us eyes to see what your spirit is doing. And God, faith to respond in the direction that you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this as we close this morning. to keep in step with your spirit truly to be led by your spirit not the spirit of this world but to be led by your spirit 
Lord, to step into situations that we never would have before because of a confidence that we have in you working in and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wednesday night at 7, we're going to have an awesome time of worship and prayer. I encourage you to be out for that. Our ministry team is going to be here at the front. If we can pray with you about anything, we'd love to do that. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend.